little simple worship. I'll give you the praise. Can I take you back a little bit? Forever and ever. so much for joining us for our midweek expression. I pray that you've had a great week thus far and that you're really seeking what God has for you on tonight. I pray that our praise and worship really uh, massaged your heart and prepared you for tonight. Uh, thanks again, as always, uh, for Brother Jason. Uh, I'm always appreciative of your ministry and what you've done to help us sustain our ministry here at New Hope. Uh, however, I know without a doubt that there is a word from the Lord on tonight. And I, as always, I pray that it strengthens your resolve to live more for Christ and gives you the confidence of knowing that your life, what that what you are sowing into ministry, into trying to do the right thing, will never be in vain. Amen. Amen. Well, family, on tonight, I'm going to deal with uh, a, a particular subject that I think all of us really need to hear. Uh, I, I, I'm not going to finish it tonight, so this is going to be just part one. There'll be a, a second installment on next week where we'll conclude our thoughts. But I want to talk a few moments about 
uh, a very familiar passage of scripture. Most of you don't know where it is, but I know even if you've been in the church for a while, if you haven't been in the church for, for a while, uh, it's going to sound very familiar. Uh, we're going to be reading from Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11. Uh, Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, and that's in the Old Testament. Uh, so get out your Bibles, get out your phones or your iPads. Uh, I pray that again, it blesses you the same way that God has blessed me with it. Jeremiah 29 and 11. And, and I, I thought for tonight is going to mean, does Jeremiah 29 and 11 mean that God won't let bad things happen to me? Is that what it means? That God is going to prohibit or to keep bad things from happening to me? For it reads, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Let me read that for you one more time. For I, God, know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. And again, does Jeremiah 29 11 mean that God won't let bad things happen to me? Will you bow with me? Father, we thank you again for a blessed opportunity to come before you, Father. We pray that something will be said or done on tonight that will uh, encourage those that are in this walk called Christianity and, and strengthen those uh, who are holding on by a thread. I pray now in the name of Jesus, Father, for those that are under my weak voice, that you would bless them as only you can, that you would touch them in such a way that, Father, that, that they would be moved, that their heart would be compelled to understand what you have in your word for their lives. Now, Father, I pray for their homes. I pray for their health and their families, Father. I pray now for their finances, Father, all that they put their hands to. I pray, Father, that according to your will, that, Father, that they would be blessed on tonight. Now, Lord, for those that may not know you in the pardon of their sin, as always, I pray that something will always be said or done that will encourage them to they, to say, what must I do to be saved? And Father, we'll be ever so mindful and careful to say thank you. Now, Lord, move me out of the way you teach. And Father, we'll be ever so mindful to give your name glory, honor, and all of the praise. It's in Jesus' name we do pray and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. Does this text mean that God won't let bad things happen to me? Well, family, this is probably one of the most popular and well-loved verses that I that I've uh, that I've had opportunity to hear, and maybe even you. We love to know that good things are ahead of us. Am I right about it? Yeah, we need hope that good things are available for us, even in the midst of our financial struggles, even in the midst of our emotional struggles, even in the midst of our relational struggles, even in the midst of child, of children's struggles, even in the midst of health challenges, and definitely in the midst of all that's been going on. I don't know about you, but I'm encouraged that this what this this, this what we've been going through for the last 15, 16, 17 months called COVID. I'm encouraged that things are getting better. And it's reassuring to know that there's a good plan, especially if it means something better than we know right now, right? Well, to be, to be prosperous, we may believe that it's to have an abundance of what feels good or what seems good to us. To be prosperous, is to have a lot of money, is to be to be prosperous, is to be full of joy with no issues of life. To be prosperous is to have a lot of materialistic things and not have to struggle to be prosperous. 
is to mean that I don't have arguments and, 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 and disconnects and things like that in my life. Everything will, will, will be a, a, a road paved with gold, filled with rose petals. That's what it means to me to be prosperous. And typically, family, we interpret the idea of prosperity to mean that there's a life free of anything bad but full of good. And finally, just like so many of us, we believe that, uh, uh, that it's our God-given design to seek out that which is good. But unfortunately, our desire for good sometimes gets cloudy. It gets mixed up. And what God put in us we fail to realize sometimes was meant to find not that which is good, how we would perceive it, but it's meant to find what's good in him. You see, since man's disconnect with, with God in the Garden of Eden, we, 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 we seek good for ourselves, believing that we can discern all that's good and evil without God's help. Yes, we do. That's how we, we seek out friendships. That's how we seek out mates. That, that, that's how we seek out jobs. That, that's how we seek out our living arrangements. We seek them out based on what we can see and how it makes us feel. But oftentimes we find that we don't seek out the will of God. Our desire for good is meant to draw us toward God who is good and gives good things to his children according to Matthew 7 and 11. Yet we continually to seek our version of good over God. How do I know that's true? I'm glad you asked because there are some of us that we believe that the relationships that we're in and definitely the marriages that we're in, that they are to always be filled with good. They are never to have conflict. We are to never have arguments. We are to, we are to always be on the same level or uh, playing field that we are to always be on the same page. We believe that any time we venture away from being on the same page, we, any time we, we venture to have an argument or a disagreement, that, that, that this, must not, this must not be of God. And how do I know that? Because there are more divorces than there are marriages. We give up because we are, we're continually trying to seek what makes us feel good instead of what makes God pleased or what makes God feel good. You see, family, this is critical to keep in mind as we consider our text tonight of Jeremiah 29 and 11. And if we rely on our definition of good, absent of God's larger view, then we're going to set ourselves up for disappointment. And we're going to miss seeing God's good play out. You know, one of the things, before as I move on, one of the things that I've learned in this thing called life is that we tend to quit before God but before God's intended purpose is played out in our lives. See, sometimes God intends for us or he allows us to go through some challenges. He allows us to go through some tests. He allows us to have some struggle in our lives, not realizing that it's through the struggle that we find out how good God is. It's through the test that we'll eventually have a testimony. But some of us quit far too soon. And before we know it, we've let go of what God meant for good in our lives. So the first thing that I want to bring up today is what did God mean when he said, for I know the plans that I have for you? What did he mean? Ironically, family, this popular verse came from a prophet who was, unpo who was very unpopular. And most of Jeremiah's words spoke of judgment. The people of Israel were caught up in, in, with, 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 with idol worship, and, and God called them to repentance. And through Jer Jeremiah, God also speaks to the Israels that were exiled to Jerusalem, saying, I know the plans 
that I have for you. And at this point, family, they experienced, they had already experienced a lot of hardship due to their, idol, their, their idolatry and King Nebuchadnezzar's rule. And this isn't unlike anything that you and I are going through today. Guess what? We have a lot of idolatry in, in our own lives. Money. We idol money. We, we idolize our women. We idolize our men. We idolize our children and jobs and our education. We idolize our homes, our cars, things that we think make us who we are, forgetting that we're only who we are because of him. So we're no different than they were. We, 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 we have idolatry deep down in our spirits. And, and when it says Nebuchadnezzar's rule, guess what? We, the money that rules our land, the people that rule our land, we look more to them, more to it than we do God. See, family, God allowed these consequences and he allowed them without losing one ounce of love toward you and I. Was this good? Well, I bet I'd be willing to bet money that they didn't think it was good. They didn't think that the consequences that they were paying were any good. Um, I, I would be willing to bet that you, as you're going through your storm, you don't think that they're good. Why? Because it didn't feel good. It doesn't feel good when we're in pain. It doesn't feel good when we're lonely. It doesn't feel good when we seem ostracized from other people because we're trying to do right. It doesn't feel good when we go through our storms and our trials. It doesn't feel good. So that's why it's hard to believe that when we go through that it's for our good. But finally, the Hebrew word translated as plan also means thoughts, intentions, and purpose. Let me say that again. Thoughts, intentions, and purpose. So when God says, I know the plans that I have for you, what he's saying is that he knows what we don't know. Ah, that's kind of hard to accept, isn't it? It's kind of hard to accept that, that that I'm going through some stuff and that what what and, and, and it's all for my good. And on the other side, there's going to be blessings. It's hard to think that I that I'm going through a divorce. It's hard to think that I'm going through the loss of a job. It's hard to think that I'm going through the loss of a loved one. It's hard to think that on the other side, it's for my good, because right now I'm hurting. Right now, I'm feeling the pain. Right now, I'm dealing with the issues of life. And here he is saying that he knows the plans that he has for me. Well, again, as I said before, yes, he does know the plans. And he is saying that he knows what you can't see right now. See, family, God knows the big picture for all of humanity from the beginning of time to the end. He knows how to cultivate good things and new growth, even at the decades of destruction and defiance. Let me share something with you. And, 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 and it's hard to understand this. But listen, when it says, when, when I just said he knows how to cultivate good things, cultivating, let's go to those that know a little bit about farming, know a little bit about planting and whatever, gardening, what have you. You cultivate the land. When you cultivate, you tear it up. You break it up and then you plant. You don't know what it, you, you, you have an idea what it's going to look like when it comes out, but you don't really know how that particular seed is going to look when it comes out. But when it comes out and it's a beautiful flower or it's a beautiful uh, 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 vegetable or whatever the situation may be, or a beautiful tree, that's when you can say, thank you, God. I didn't know what it was going to look like exactly when I planted it, but look at what you've done. And that's how our lives will be. God is saying, listen, you can't see what it's going to look like now. You have no clue how it's going to look right, how it's going to look when you come out, but I do. And because I know the plans that I have for you, guess what? What you're going through, it may not feel good, but it's not going to harm you because you're going to get through it. 
God knows the thoughts and, and the intentions of his heart for you and I, which is always for restoration. And, and it's his intention to bring us closer to him and, 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 and closer to his original design for our sake and for his kingdom. In other words, family, what you're going through right now, basically what he's saying is, is that I'm using that to draw you closer to me. Let's just be honest about it. The more you struggle, the more you pray. The tougher your trial, the more you get into this word. So when you're going through, sometimes he's using those opportunities to draw you closer to him. And when you draw closer to him, your relationship with him becomes stronger. And when your relationship with him becomes stronger and you come out on the other side of your trials and of your storms, then you become a witness for his kingdom. And family, although God's people were repeatedly unfaithful, just like we are now, God remained faithful. You see, consequences occurred as a result of broken and sinful living. And God's love, though, shines through in the restoration he promises to all of his people. Jeremiah 29, 5 and 6, he tells us to, to he tells them to build homes, plant food, and settle down. Build homes, plant food, and settle down. Now, family, the thoughts and the intentions and the purposes of God are to help us experience his good no matter how much gets or bad gets mixed in. Let me share something with you. Even in the midst of your storms, you still got something to shout about. Even in the midst of your trials, you still can be a witness, a test of, you can testify to the goodness of God. You can, you can tell him, though he slay me, yet will I serve him. See, sometimes it includes family. Sometimes it includes our view of, of, of prosperity, and, and sometimes it doesn't. But now, that leads me to my next point, because I need for us to, to really grasp this. See, when what seems good is not really good. See, for some of us, we just want something that feels good. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We want something that feels good, but sometimes it's not good for us. And because I'm not exactly sure who our audience may be, and there may be some children, I'm not going to get too deep into some of the situations, but you know what I'm talking about. There are some things that, there are some decisions that we make that we know good and well are not good for us. But yet and still, because they feel good on occasion, because they feel good every now and again, you make this a decision to be there. You make a decision to deal with it, knowing that it's really not good for you. But can I share something with you? God always wants for us what is good. All the time. Now, unlike some of the things that we do that are temporal, God desires for us to have things all the time that feel good, like peace, like joy, like freedom, like love, like kindness. He wants us to experience those things on a regular. But why? Because they make us feel good. I don't know about you, but to be at peace is better than any amount of money that I've ever had. To have joy is better than anything that I've ever dealt with. Having real freedom. Let me share something with you. I've had my freedom taken. I've had my freedom. I've been locked up. The key seemed like it was thrown away. And I felt as though that there was no way that I was going to experience freedom until I got out. But can I share something with you? One day a man by the name of Jesus Christ really stepped into my life. And he showed me what real freedom is. So it didn't matter that I was locked up behind bars. It didn't matter when they let me out from behind bars but I was still bound by paper of parole. It didn't matter the fact that there was so there was un, uh, 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 there was certain things that I couldn't do based on my past.
past or what was going on in my life. It didn't matter because the real freedom that I was experiencing on the inside, on the inside of my heart, that freedom is priceless. And there's so much available for those who love God and will, are willing to receive it from him. You know, family, throughout the days of creation, God called his work good. Yes, he did. And, and, and he's never stopped declaring that his desire for good to be seen through his workmanship, which, guess what, are you and I. We are his workmanship. However, the enemy knows our design to seek good and our desire to choose our version of good. That's why he keeps coming at you and he's playing on your heartstrings. He's playing with your mind. He's playing with your pride. He's playing with your ego and through those means that he uses those to get to you and he, he's causing you to choose temporary good versus eternal good. He uses things that seem to that seem good to keep us from experiencing good in the plans that God has for us. Let me share something with you. And I know somebody, you'll be able to testify to this. Have you ever bought a car and man, the car, I mean, brand new, you got in it, man, and you didn't go to buy it. You wasn't planning on buying a new car, but somehow or another, you, you ended up at the car dealership. Maybe you were trying to get your old car serviced. Maybe you were trying to get your your car mechanically fixed or maybe you were dropping someone else off to look at another car and you got caught up with looking and you said in something and somehow somewhere a salesman got through to you and he made you start thinking about getting another car and you started smelling how good it smelled you started feeling how supple the leather was and man you couldn't uh, you just couldn't uh, get over the fact that it didn't have any miles on it, that you were going to be the first owner and that they are making it so easy for you to get. And man, you went ahead and you decided to get that car, even though you had a good car that was paid for, even though you had a good car that had no mechanical issues, but they made you feel so good that you decided to get that car. You got the car and everything was fine for the first week or two, for the first month, but then you got that first bill. And I don't care what you say and I don't care how you try to put it. When now is when the rubber meets the road. Now you got to start making that payment. And now in the back of your mind, you're thinking to yourself, what in the world was I thinking about? I had that which was good and I decided to go and get something different. And now I got a car note. That's how the devil works on, on us sometimes in life. He makes us forget about how good things really are. He makes us forget about how the things that God is really interested in. He makes us forget about how God provides those things that we really need and we start looking at things that we don't simply because of our ego, simply because of our pride, simply because of our greed, simply because we start coveting what other folk have. And instead of looking at the what God has already given us and he's provided for us through the death, burial, and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ, we start looking everywhere else. That's how the devil keeps working on you. That's why over in Jeremiah 23, 16 and 17, he says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. Watch this. Do not listen to what the prophets are prophesying to you. They will fill you with false hopes. They speak visions from their own minds, not from the mouth of the Lord. They keep saying to those who despise me, the Lord says, you will have peace. And to all who follow the stubbornness of their hearts, they say no harm will come to you. Family, God's people were again warned in verses 8 and 9 not to listen to the diviners that deceive because he did not send them. The good they promised was not in line with the plans of God. Some of you feel that just because you can, that it's the plan of God. Let me share something with you. You know the difference when it's God's will versus your will. 
And in the end, we'll keep chasing after our own plan, which keeps us from experiencing the real fruits of the Spirit that, 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 that's offered over in Galatians 5, 22 and 23, which God, He wants us to experience. We grow these fruits. We can only grow these fruits, though, rather through trust and active steps with God through the trials and the hurts that are part of this reality that we call life. Yes. Well, family, I need you to understand how you get there. We need God's whole picture view. We need God's whole picture view. We need to, we need to be able to see. And how do you see? You see by trusting. Our verse says, I know the plans that I have for you. And family, those plans can as well include prosperity. See, we hear something we want to hear. And it's tempting, family, to cling to this verse alone and believe that this is the whole picture that God is painting for us. And as I mentioned earlier, it's critical to remember our view of God does not include the whole of God's intent or his thoughts toward us and purposes for our lives. See, unlike the false prophets, and now let me share something with you. When I say all false prophets, I'm not talking about those that say that they're called of God. I'm talking about those that are trying to sell you a bill of goods. They're trying to sell you uh, like a uh, wolf ticket. They're, they're, they're trying to sell you uh, 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 those wooden nickels, things that aren't really good for you. I'm talking about folk that have no good intention in their hearts. They're just trying to profit off of you. And unlike the false prophets, the good God speaks of in, 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 in one verse isn't the fullness of how he operates, which we see through a larger view, family, that are uh, based on scripture. His goodness is not based on false promises that line up with our version of good. They are based on his loving and whole picture view of bringing about good plans. In other words, family, when God is putting something together, He's taking a little bit from here and he's taking a little bit from over there and he's pulling a little bit from back there and he's pulling some struggles from over there and he's pulling some trials from over there and as he's using them to mold your experiences, what he's doing is that he's fixing it in such a way that when you do get to where you see prosperity, and I'm not talking about a bunch of money, I'm not talking about a bunch of stuff, I'm saying when he gets you to where he wants you at, not only will you be more appreciative, but you will be able to handle it better because now you've come through some stuff and you've learned what God has for your life. See, family, the process of growth, I don't care what nobody says, it sometimes feel bad and sometimes it feels like you're going down in quicksand as it may seem that it takes forever but even so we're in the process and God sees the outcome which we never will be able to comprehend see we see in part but God sees in whole 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and 9 says, For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Job 28 and 24 says, For he views the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. In other words, family, we can only see what's right in front of us. But we don't know what tomorrow holds. If we were to be honest about it, we don't know what the next minute holds. We don't know what the next second holds, but God does. Are you with me? God does. Now, for some of us, the unfortunate part is God's plan doesn't always feel good. See, we might read the verses of God's judgment and see only the bad. But and, but and we might read Jeremiah 29, 11 and only see what seems or what feels good. 
And God's truth, though, family, gleaned throughout the totality of Scripture shows us the reality that, that bad things will happen to you and I on this earth. And some has cons and some will be because there are consequences of our actions. Some will be beca because there are consequences of others' choices. And some will be because of the brokenness of this world. But and God's truth, family, and whole reveals the redemption and healing that has been made possible by him. Again, that's through the death, burial, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jeremiah, our text tonight, speaks about the plan that God has for people who seek him with their whole heart. Who turn away from the false versions of goodness and, and, and those that choose to lean into God's goodness. See, when we seek him first and allow his thoughts to shape our, to shape our thoughts, we need to admit that where we've been prideful and how our plans have messed things up, we need to be able to admit that. And we need to admit that our need, or recognize rather, that our need meets his provision. Have you ever turned away from something that you wanted or let go of something that seemed good because it was necessary for something better? At the time, I bet it felt like it was a challenge and it probably felt frustrating. I found that the process of growth is messy. And the process of growth can be painful. But in the end, it produces a changed life with better experiences. Even when things aren't the way that we wish they were. I pray that you can understand what I just said. You see, there have been some things in my life that have happened. It's not the way that I would have chosen. But I'm grateful that they turned out that way. And if you were to be honest tonight, the same thing has happened in your life. So family, on next week, I'm going to stop there, but on next week, we're going to talk about what Jeremiah 29, 11 really means. And we're going to close it out on next week. May God bless you, and may God keep you, is our prayer. Will you bow with me? Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you so much for what you've done in our lives, and we pray, Father, that we would continue to grow and accept your will for our lives even when it doesn't feel good I pray that we accept your will for our lives now Father have your way please Jesus and Lord I pray that we be ever so mindful and careful to give your name glory all of the honor and all of the praise it's in Jesus' name we do pray and we ask it all. Amen. And thank God. Well, family, God bless you. May God keep you as our prayer as always. I pray you have a great evening, a great, wonderful rest of the week. And I hope to see you in the house on this coming Sunday. 9 a.m. for Sunday school, 10 a.m. for our, our morning worship hour. I'd love to have you. We're doing the, we're doing the very best that we can to ensure that everyone is safe. We are social distancing. We are uh, 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 sanitizing. We are doing what we can to assure that everybody is safe. So we'd love to have you come out, hang out with us. I want you to know, and don't you ever forget, we love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. God bless, and may God keep you, is our prayer. Good night.